good afternoon everybody <clears throat> thanks for joining this session and uh, it's a very unique occasion because i'm told this is the first time uh, world economic forum a regional event in india is having a science and health stream also and there are several sessions which have been lined up on science and technology as well as health which some of you would be attending and the timing of his, this session itself i believe is this session is called scientific india it could not have been better and this week as we know we are celebrating science the nobel prize session is on so it's a very right time for a discussion on science in india and its various facets especially the subject of nobel prize often evokes different kinds of reactions in india very often people ask what can india do to win a nobel prize i am not going to ask that question but that's a question which is you know uppermost in the mind of several people including policy makers i'm sure if there was a politician on the panel he or she would have asked this question there's no when I mean, people even have asked that is there any magic formula to win a nobel prize what if we have a policy goal to make india one of the top 3 science superpowers by 2030 then we need to look for solutions if certainly not a magic formula to win a nobel prize of course india has done a lot right in science if you know i mean i'm not going to get into that you know we have had uh, several achievements and to start with your space and atomic energy the green and white revolutions all those are great achievements for a country because a number of countries achieved independence at the time when india did and very few of them are at the stage where india is today but at the same time we need to ask some hard questions we need to go to the next level if the goal the stated goal is by 2030 we need to be a science power whatever that means that's stated in the policy and part of that discussion we are going to focus on today afternoon <clears throat> i'm very privileged to have such an illustrious and diverse set of people sitting on the dais and if i start uh, introducing all of them i'll we'll have no time left for the discussion but to put it briefly the kind of expertise we have today and we have uh, dr ramgopal rao is the director of iit delhi was earlier at iit bombay as you know iits are the top most you know technology and engineering schools as well as innovation hubs of india he himself is a renowned nanotechnologist and an inventor he has close to 3 dozen patents to his credit i believe so he can talk from his personal experience as well as a technology leader and he has also co-founded a company called nano sniff technologies limited while he was at bombay at iit bombay we have uh, chris gopalakrishnan for a business audience or a forum like wef i don't think i need to introduce him i mean he is one of the technology industry founders having been a co-founder of infosys and a deep interest in philanthropy and basic science in 2014 he announced a donation of rupees 225 crores to the indian institute of science to start a center for brain research which is a unique donation not only in the history of indian institute of science but i would say in the history of indian science itself there has been no such single donation devoted to basic science as such. so it that stands as an example and shows his deep interest in promoting basic research and very few examples like that we can find and next to chris is uh, sucharita sebastian he is an associate professor of physics at cavendish 
and what I found intriguing about her biodata while going through her you know, brief information about her, that she also holds a degree, she has been a management consultant and holds a degree of MBA from IIM Ahmedabad, so a physicist turned management consultant, but she's right now at uh, Cavendish teaching physics. And the far end is Shahid Jamil, again a renowned uh, a scientist who was heading the virology group at ICGEB, International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. And now he is the CEO of the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance, which is a very unique alliance, which is easily one of the largest funded collaborative, joint collaborative effort between India and another country. Its a mechanism has produced some very good results, which again adds value to the expertise which we have today. So we have an entire, uh, you know, a full set of people to talk about science and technology. People who have done science, people who are still doing science, people who are leaders, and people who have promoted technology and basic science. <clears throat> so it's a diverse and cross-disciplinary group, as well as an audience. I'm sure there's a lot of expertise resides here. So this is going to be an interactive session on science and technology, as it's called the Scientific Indian. And I'm told the session is being live streamed, so there are many people who will be watching it live from wherever they are. So the message which will emanate from here will be carried forward. And I'm sure today afternoon we'll have a meaningful and stimulating dialogue and interaction. So let me start with all the panelists with a brief overview question, if you could answer in a couple of minutes each. What are the top three or four things which we need to do right? to achieve that goal of, you know, becoming a, one of the top three, four leaders in science and technology. Of course, we have discussed the problems a number of times, so let's look out for some solutions. What are the things which we need to do right? Very briefly, and then we'll get on to some of the building blocks in terms of investments, in terms of innovation network, and in a few other things. So shall I start with uh, Dr. Rao? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I am in a way representing the IIT system. And IITs are often either the poster boys or the whipping boys, depending on <laughs> where you go. So and I think government still uh, does spend a lot of money on IITs. But again, the question is, how have we contributed to the to the nation building? I think you know it all depends on how you look at it. But overall, if you look at the Indian scenario, India is doing pretty well, not many of you might know. In terms of research, India is actually doing pretty well. We are ranked at the fifth or sixth level in the world right now, depending on which databases you look at. We are either at the fifth position or sixth position in terms of our scientific content, scientific output. Count the number of papers written from India. So, so I think things have become pretty good in terms of nanotechnology. We are ranked third in the world right now, only behind China and US. And uh, in fact, according to some of the recent uh, statistics, per dollar spent, you know, Indians write more papers than anybody in the world, much better than China. So I think so. We have become experts at converting money into research. So that part, I think, Indian institutions are doing very well. You give us more money, we will write more papers. I think that there is uh, no problem at all. But I think, you know, one of the things which we are very poor at is converting that research back to money. That we have not been able to do very well. I admit that even IITs, though we are now talking about it and trying to do that, which might take some time. But, uh, but I think converting that research back to money, that ecosystem is missing in IT kind of sectors, you know, since uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan is here. I think in IT sector, probably that has happened, but in hardcore technology kind of areas, it has not happened. And we are all struggling, you know, uh, with that particular kind of an aspect. But there are reasons why, you know, we have not been very good at it. In India, you know, coming from a cultural background, 
uh, that we all have uh, for indians you know you know we worship different goddesses for wealth and knowledge and bringing lakshmi and saraswati together is often a challenge in any indian system and uh, an academic you know making lots of money there is a peer pressure within the institutes that this guy must be doing something wrong or not teaching very well not writing papers only after making money i think there is a kind of a peer pressure against people who are you know who are supposed to be seeking knowledge but then at some point they tend to focus more on money i think these are all cultural issues which we need to overcome but but i should tell you that you know uh, the younger generation is our you know hope i think they are at least in iit is the kind of students we are seeing things are looking better but i think one thing you know though we are writing lots of papers one thing which is definitely missing in our system is context and relevance the relevance of our research the context to our what we do i think that part is missing but that is missing simply because we are a government of india funded institutions our money comes primarily from mhrd and and we have all the autonomy to work on whatever problem we want people are not giving us enough problems the the industry academia interaction in this country has been pretty weak i think we all have to blame both the sides for for that and there is lot of uh, you know trust deficit between these two institutions and uh, that is something which we are all trying to correct but unless industry interacts with academia more closely i don't think this uh, relevance problem will ever uh, get solved and and also you know our education is also quite fragmented right now if you want to build do science we go and start science institutes if you want to do medicine we go and start medical institutes want to do engineering start iits but we have not been building universities or institutions which are focusing you know the whole thing holistically and we are not putting problem first in all our research thing we don't look at you know how can i improve agricultural productivity what technologies are required and then once you you know identify that as a problem then all these disciplines everything will vanish but that we are not doing enough you know if you are an electrical engineer you work on electrical problem mechanical mechanical problems in the process we are not solving the problems the way we should be doing i think this fragmentation of education is something we need to consciously uh, you know overcome that is one thing we need to do everything possible to bring in industry you know closer to academia and i was recently in some government of india meeting you know government is expecting a, a arranged marriage to happen between industry and academia which is not happening and uh, no i'm sorry the government is expecting a love marriage to happen between academia and industry which is not happening and i am telling them you know you arrange the marriages you just make sure that industry has no choice but to come and you know invest some part of their money in these academic institutions and over a period of time there will be win win kind of relationships some of them will succeed they will come back again i think you know we need to somehow make sure that industry has no choice but to work with academia you know in country, country, the industries like infosys are doing a great job in the infosys the science foundation and all of them i think are are making an effort in that direction infosys also runs the triple it and all that but i think that has to happen with more of these multinational industries more of other industries i think you know, unless we make that happen i don't see much future we will continue to write more papers you know beyond that nothing much will change in this country thank you chris the ball is in your court would you <laughs> thank prefer an arranged marriage or a love marriage uh thank you um let me start off you know you talked about uh, this is the season of nobel prize right yeah. uh, the nobel prize for physics uh, went for uh, the work on uh, gravitational waves the ligo project as it's called um you know the three people who got the prize rainer weiss uh, barry barish and kip thorn they have been working at it from 1970 onwards you know 40 almost 40 years and only recently they you know they saw success in fact uh, if i read right i think barish left his work went and did something else and then came back to mit and restarted his research because you know he felt he was not getting anywhere there is another reason why i wanted to say this as many as 37 indian scientists from nine institutes are actually part of this effort you know overall about 1000 people around the world are part of this effort co-authors yeah. 
So about 37 people have actually fully contributed and co-authors of this uh, research paper. Uh, people uh, like um, Sanjay uh, Durandar at the IUCAA has been working at it for 30 years. So large, ambitious projects take long periods of time. And the cost of LIGO project is in billions of dollars. Billions of dollars, actually. So let me now come to you ask the question, you know, what are some of the solutions? One, you know, we need to have ambitious mission mode programs, a few of them. And when we do that, I'm confident in saying, uh, I agree with um, Ram Gopal, you know, our scientists are actually second to none. But they are narrowly focused. It's typically one professor, one PhD student, very small fund, amount of fund, and very narrowly focused. Of course, in theory, one person can come out with breakthrough, but in you know, any, any other field, you know, some experiments like this, you need large setup, large amount of money, large groups. We need some mission mode projects. That's my first thing. I think we have to think big. Um, and since these are all multidisciplinary, you will find ways in which there are different groups that can contribute to that. Second, uh, I firmly believe that the funding to research has to increase. Today, India invests 0.9% of GDP in research. It has to go to at least 2%. Co countries like Korea invest 4%. Because we are behind, I think we should target 4%. Of this 0.9%, industry invests 0.3%. So my first request to my industry colleagues is take it to at, at least 1.7%. So your contribution becomes 2%. The government invests the remaining 0.6%. Government has to put in an additional 1.4%, so we let's target to 4%. I think we need to do that. This is required to secure the future because the future will be built through innovation-driven, knowledge-driven economy. So we need to increase the funding for research. Uh, the government has a scheme for CSR funding. Um, you know, uh, Ram Gopal uh, mentioned this. You know, uh, can we allocate? 1%, that's 2% of your profits have to be allocated for CSR. Out of that, 1% goes to solve existing problems, and 1% goes to solve future problems, which is research. So can we you know, now subdivide this 2% into 1% for you know, current problems and 1% for future problems? We also need to create ecosystems around institutions for the translational work that needs to be done. Every large uh, department, at least at the institute level, we need to have a function for translational research. You know, if you go to MIT, Cambridge, etc., you will find a department, full-fledged department, looking at translational research and things like that. I have seen personally at IIT Madras Research Park, more than 100 startups are already there, up and running. If you look at the Economic Times Award, out of the five awards startups got four were from IIT Madras ecosystem. It is working. A government has allotted money for, I think, six more institutions to start research park. They are at various stages, but none of them have been started yet. I think we need to accelerate that and we need to get that going very quickly because these ecosystems help in the translational uh, work. And um, uh, you know, bottom line, I, I firmly believe that, um, you know, we have good talent, we have good science, good scientists. We have to make some changes. We have to increase the funding. We have to create that ecosystem. We have to bring businesses closer, especially in the translational part of the work. And we will see big results. And we need to have ambitious goals. You know, for example, personally, I'm looking at um, aging and the brain. I'm looking at... Um, uh, how can we look at the brain and understand uh, new models of computing? So think big and, and, and you will see results happen. Um, so I think probably I'm closest to fundamental researchers, so I'll speak a bit about that. And my career has mostly been outside India, so I studied at Stanford, now I am faculty at Cambridge. Um, so at least in my field, so I, uh, I work in physics, in experimental physics. Um, 
So I would say it's a bit, I think it's a little bit self-congratulatory to say, oh, we're doing fine and our research is okay. Um, at least in my field, if you look at um, scientific output, I would say of the top papers in nature and science, there's almost nothing coming out of Indian institutions. That's not to say Indian researchers aren't premier, but they're not at Indian institutions, they're often at institutions abroad. And I think we need to acknowledge that. And I think it's not a question of how much output is coming out, it's um, what is the caliber of it. And I think we've got used to mediocrity. When we talk about, oh, we have this many papers, what is the quality of the papers? How many of them are in the top journals? Uh, are they in a nature or, or science quality journal? Um, so in my field, there was, so even if you look at TIFR, I did a summer research project at TIFR. Uh, the researchers there are excellent, but there was one science paper that came out, and this was, it was a very good paper, but this was some kind of cause for uh, immense surprise that there had been like one paper that had come out of TIFR in, I don't know, like a decade. Um, so I think we need to recognize that a culture of excellence in fundamental research is missing right now in the Indian context. And in order to change this, we need to acknowledge that there's a vacuum right now. And I think um, excellence in other fields is recognized. Um, so um, obviously, you know, we're familiar with, um, would say, um, um, say excellence in, in uh, the area of, of uh, cricketing or, or Bollywood stars, but when it comes to scientific excellence, there's like the Nobel Prize, and then there's this big vacuum, as though a Nobel Prize is going to appear out of nowhere if there isn't a pool of excellent research happening. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, so, so I think there's a couple of uh, things that need to change. So obviously, um, funding needs to be increased, but so, so say at TFR or, or IAC, um, Specifically, funding's not an issue because I think the, the limited amount of funding there is, it's concentrated in a few locations. But I think the amount of funding increasing is necessary for a volume of excellent research to be built up. So I've considered coming back to TFR at places like that, but uh, the challenge is not funding because you get grants. The challenge is, is there um, an excellent, um, are there excellent colleagues? Is there a culture where uh, you have people, you collaborate to do fundamental research, you need collaborations, you need people to work with, you need peers you can discuss things with. And so there needs to be a large ecosystem where it's not just like one person um, who's excellent and this is not going to survive in a sort of a barren ecosystem. Just because uh, doing research is challenging in and of itself and you need a support mechanism, you need excellent researchers to uh, increase morale, to increase um, the pool with which you can collaborate. So I think funding increase needs to go into volumes of uh, uh, excellent researchers and not just one or two here or there. Um, I think in terms of attracting back scientific diaspora, I don't think India is doing a very good job at all. I think China is doing an excellent job. So uh, in my class at Stanford, you had both uh, uh, Indian origin researchers and Chinese origin researchers and faculty as well. And I think um, there's a big push by the Chinese government to bring back researchers at all levels. So not just, say, at the postdoc or assistant level, at the level where they lead institutes so they can come back and establish institutes in China. And there's a drive for them really to compete and say we're the best at this, and they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the US. And the Indian researchers just get sucked into the US system, which for understandable reasons, um, there, there is no drive to bring them back, there's no incentive. So in China, there's an incentive called, I think it's like a thousand leading lights where uh, there's different mechanisms for people to come back, either full-time or spend a few months in China um, and contribute to uh, research there. So there's various different schemes, but this is an active, actively promoted uh, way for the scientific diaspora to come back, which I don't see in India. Um, so all, all of these are not you know, uh, problems from which uh, there is no recovery, and the uh, the tragedy is that actually scientific res uh, researchers from India are, of course, among the top caliber. They're everywhere. If you look at a paper, it has a slew of Indian names on it. They're just not at Indian institutes. So to me, that's, that's the challenge. Um, and 
Finally, I think this, um, the fundamental applied um, connection. So I think, um, as Chris mentioned, so I think one of the things that needs to be recognized is that in order for applied technology to, to uh, come out, there needs to be a vast background of fundamental research. Again, it's not going to come out of a vacuum. You so when, say, uh, uh, communications was invented, so cell phones, uh, the telegraph, radio, this was built on the back of electromagnetic waves. And this was a discovery that was a purely theoretical discovery. So Maxwell uh, conjured up these equations. They were just purely mathematical equations. And this was purely curiosity driven. And uh, decades down the line, all of contemporary technology is based on this. But I think for the government to say, OK, let's tackle these immediate problems, go away and do some research and solve these problems that affect society today. Of course, it's critical to be addressing these problems and for research in institutions to work hand in hand with industry, and I think this is critical. But I think that fundamental research in and of itself needs to be valued and with the understanding that it will take time for it to percolate to a technological translation. This doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that there needs to be a vibrant uh, fundamental pool of research in order for applications to emerge, and it's not going to emerge out of nothing. Thank you. Thanks, Anish. You know, the, <clears throat> that's a good thing about speaking last. Uh, that you've heard what everyone said, but the bad thing is that everything useful has been said. Uh, so the let me re will begin from reiterate your end. A <laughs> The next round will begin from your end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me reiterate a couple of points. I think uh, you made a very good point about basic and fundamental research. And uh, suddenly the atmosphere in the country is that all you should do is applied research. CSIR has been told, for example, that no basic research will be funded. They should be working only on, on applied things, products, processes. Uh, and there is, there's, there's a fundamental flaw in that. And she mentioned it very, very clearly that you need a very large background of good basic work for you know, good products, processes to come out of that. This is the Nobel Prize season. You know, you, you're hearing every day a prize being announced. Just the other day, the chemistry prize was announced for cryo-electron microscopy. Now, cryo-electron microscopy, which is being used today to solve structures that will lead to drug discovery and many other things, was a very, very fundamental problem when it was studied. Uh, you look at gene editing, which has become very hot right now. The CRISPR-Cas technology, which is at the, you know, at the base of this uh, gene editing, developed because people were interested in, in studying how bacteria protect themselves against viruses that affect bacteria. A very, very basic problem uh, and you know this technology came out of that. So the point is, and there are there are thousands of such examples. The point is that you need a very good, you know, background of basic research for good things to come out of it. And uh, the same really goes for 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 innovation. Uh, you know, innovation requires a threshold. There has to be a size threshold, and a tipping point comes eventually. I don't believe we have reached that tipping point in the country because we are not in, we've really not invested in size as far as the numbers of people who are doing science and technology in the country, as well as the amount of funding that is going into science and technology. Um, you know, I, Think of the example in, in very layman terms of Mount Everest. Mount Everest is the highest peak in the world, but the peak doesn't stand in isolation. You know, that peak is part of the Himalayan range of mountains. If there was no Himalayas, there would be no Mount Everest. So let's try to create the range. I think the peaks will emerge themselves. So that's, that's an important idea to take from this. Like Chris said, 
we need to raise the level of funding. We are currently funding at point. 88% of GDP, and we must go to 2% of GDP. We've been hearing about it for the last 10, 13 years. Uh, two terms of UPA we have been hearing, and, and, and the last three years we've been hearing it hasn't happened. It must happen. Uh, so the three things, when, uh, Dinesh, that you asked us to highlight, one, of course, is funding. The other is do good science. Don't worry about basic science or applied science. Just do good science. There's no good, there's no basic or applied science. There's only good science and bad science. So let's try to do good science. Uh, and the time has come for us to be doing more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary science, which is aimed at solving problems. And if we are able to do that, then you know everything that we desire will come out of it. And the one point which uh, you know I don't believe anyone touched on, which I would say uh, is on my top three list, is that we should nurture young talent. There is a lot of young talent that is coming into India today. Uh, and that is because of improved facilities back home, but also very serious funding problems overseas. NIH in US, National Institutes of Health, is funding at six or seven percentile. 95 percent, 94 percent of the grants are getting rejected. People are not getting funded. Very, very good people. Some of those people are moving out of necessity. So let's, let's grab that opportunity. But when I say nurture young talent, what I'm saying is that, you know, we should provide these people the right ecosystems to work in. This is what I do in a day job. Uh, the, the program I run is a fellowship program. We bring in people with very good funding, and we bring really the best people. Our funding rate is about 10%, so 90% of people who apply to us don't, don't get, get it. But when we place these people in institutions, the institutions are not backing them up as much as they should be backing them up. They're not backing them up for becoming future leaders. They're not backing them up for communicating their work well. And they of often have to struggle with something as small as a health insurance policy for their family. Uh, so, you know, there are structural issues that institutions need to solve when we, before we are able to really, uh, for, for us to be able to really support our young people. So I'll stop there. Thanks. <clears throat> I think quite a few uh, strands have come out of this very brief discussion. One, of course, is relating to the big issue of R&D and how do you R&D funding? How do you increase that kitty which has been there for a long time? Is it through CSR? Is it through a forced marriage with industry, or is it to simply enhance government funding? And when we these days, we don't even hear about increasing public's investment in R&D. I mean, the government has been telling, as you mentioned, Shahid, that, you know, get money from the industry or get money from CSR. So there's a little bit of a confusion on the front of uh, funding. How do we increase the basket of funding? Is it through, is it CSR versus CSIR, or is it the government which is going to fund? I mean, we are still to hear that, you know, a solid statement from the government that, you know, we are going to back basic research. We are going to back s and and increase R&D funding. Because if you look at the Dehradun Declaration, which has been in force for almost three years now, which clearly says that you know these are the mandated things which the national institutes are supposed to do, and quite a few of them are engaged in doing that. So is that the way we are going to go ahead and increase funding? Or in fact, in effect, there has been a shrinking of funding, I would say. In practice, people have not been paid for regular projects, and there have been and no major uh, projects coming up. But at the same time, there have been big commitments which have been made in the past uh, 10 years about the India's participation in big science. Like, if you look at LHC, look at the LIGO arm, look at the square kilometer array. So those are big projects, which is a positive and which will have an impact uh, or a spillover effect on the academia, on industry. It will lead to a lot of you know skill building and need for the next level of 
innovation in areas of manufacturing as well. So those are the positive ones. So funding is a major issue. Second uh, point which has emerged so far is that, you know, we need an ecosystem to do fundamental research. We have been doing, the institutes have been there, but is that system good enough to produce, you know, a paper in science or nature every week or every few months or every, even a few times a year? So that is a, a, another takeaway. And the third important takeaway which Dr. Rao raised in the beginning was about the ecosystem of working in collaboration with industry. So these are, I think, three four takeaways which uh, we have had so far. And uh, <clears throat> specifically on this whole issue of funding, R&D funding, if I have to ask a specific question as to how do we really increase, is it, should it come from the government? Because if you are talking of CSR money, it's a tied fund. You know, it is tied to something, it is tied to the goals of the industry. It's like hot money in the financial market. It is there today, it may not be there tomorrow. It is linked to the profits of the industry. So it's too dicey a thing to depend on CSR money. So what are the new mechanisms which we can think of increasing R&D funding? Very briefly, very pointed solutions if from the panel. Anybody could start? Yeah, sure, Chris. So um, as I mentioned, you know, if we can look at um, the CSR funding itself and look at 1% of that going for research. That's one solution. Second is, um, you know, there are significant philanthropists in the country today. And, um, uh, you know, world over, if you look at um, many of the uh, research is funded by philanthropists. Um, so we need to look at how we can increase um, philanthropy involvement in research, which is I'm talking to, again, my friends um, uh, in the industry about this. Uh, third, uh, you know, I clearly see that the government needs to increase its funding also. So as I said, it's about 0.6% of GDP. Uh, I feel that we have to do a lot of catching up, and so that's why I said 4% should be spent on research and innovation, uh, at least for the near future. In fact, if you look at the actual numbers today in any IIT system I'm well aware of, 85% of funding comes from a government source. It's usually 10 to 15% which comes from the industries. It and is that the is the biggest challenge. R&D R &D The total, no, the, yeah, the R&D funding, what you can see. And uh, running of the institutes anyway comes yeah. from government. And R&D funding, uh, only 15%. Maximum is what is coming from the industry. That has to change because with the industry money will also come, you know, the real problems, the right problems, and all of that. I think that has to happen. And unfortunately, you know, I have been, of course, I interact with many industries and all that. And you know, the travel budgets of many industries in India is higher than the money they spend on the academic institutions. They can go and look at the balance sheets of many of our multinationals. The industry has been. I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, like I said, Infosys kind of companies are an exception. But but a multinational company, I have looked at it. I have the data to show. I don't want to name any industry. The travel budgets are more than the money you spend on the academic institutions in the country. And they are the people who recruit all of our students. And they have to somewhere support this education in some way. Government cannot do everything. Of course, government has to spend more money. And the, as a percentage of GDP, it has to happen. But time has come now to you know do something to the industry so that they come and work with the academia. I think unless we do that, there is actually, you know, I don't see any much of a future. And I also don't believe in this basic and applied and all of that. Research is research, good research or bad research. And if your goal is to make everything 10x cheaper, 10x better, every research becomes basic research. You know, so the, today if you have a technology and if I want to make it 10x cheaper in the future, you have to work on materials, you have to work on new processes, you have to work on so many different things. It becomes eventually a basic research which will become applied at some point of time. I think you know our goal in the academic institutions, particularly IITs, needs to be making things 10x cheaper, 10x better. And then the question is, you know, how do we now build that ecosystem so that we become more focused in what we do and eventually deliver? And once we do that, these nature papers will come, the science papers will come, and all of that will eventually happen. I think uh, I think that that mindsets need to change. Industry needs to come forward, and the government policies need to in a way promote that sort of association. I think uh, you know, government has a major role to play, of course, in increasing the funding, but also in policies. Right. And government in this country is, is too soft on everything. I think government at some point of time needs to be a little bit 
tougher and uh, i think you know that's that that has to be the role of the government so shahid yeah so yes the funding has funding for research has to primarily come from the government industry as dinesh was mentioning you know the csr funding is is rather uh, you know fluid so most of it has to come from government but you know i'll pick up on another point it's not just the size of the funding but the timing of the funding you know if an investigator doesn't get the money on time all the effort is wasted and this has been happening quite a bit that you know f first of all when when a government funding agency gives a grant they give a grant for 3 years this has to change this has to go to a 5 year grant cycle because in a 3 year grant what happens is that you're all a, a senior investigator is always writing grants can't focus on the work uh and even in the 3 year grant the first year money will arrive on time and the second year money will arrive towards the end of the third year and that creates a very very big problem for for people who depend on this uh so the timing has to be right as well and as far as the size the size of the funding is concerned i'll just leave you with one very interesting statistic in life sciences if you compare let's say the indian research ecosystem versus the us research ecosystem in us the biggest funding agency for life sciences is the national institutes of health it has a budget of about 32 billion dollars in india our biggest life sciences funder is department of biotechnology its budget is about 2200 crores put this in perspective what nih spends in 3 days dbt spends in a year size does matter because there has to be a threshold and a tipping point and we haven't arrived there thank you suchitra um yeah i would just like to uh, reemphasize that i think government funding is critical and i think what we found with the uh, research funding is that um industry funding and philanthropist funding is of course uh, vital to uh, the progress of um research but one of the issues is that sometimes this tends to be too uh, closely tied with the direction of research and it tends to uh, mandate what research should be on and i think the government has the ability to fund just purely for excellence and mer uh, merit and not dictate the direction of the funding and i think there needs to be a pool of funding which is purely excellence based and so i think the industry may have its ups and downs and what area it might like to fund in so if we need to have a baseline of consistent funding which isn't subject to the whims of particular areas then this has to come from the government thank you at this stage uh, i think i'll throw open the discussion to all of you if you have any question to any of the members on the panel please ask keep your question short identify yourself so that we know your background thank you anybody sure so i'm pretty sana i run the think tank i run the think tank of yes bank just back from the us so my question to mr rao i want to see more state of the art labs in india you know these research labs you talked about um iit as you said funded by government so what can we do i mean what are the incentives to industry to come in and invest so that state of the art labs can come up we need that to keep great researchers in 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 town thank you i think that is a that's a good model at iit delhi you know we uh, started this industry day and all that but uh, you know i can give you one example of applied materials at uh, which is what i did uh, at iit bombay now for example in applied materials which is an american giant uh, in terms of the semiconductor industry and the manufacturing they set up uh, a lab at iit iit bombay you know spent about 10 million dollars and they that's an endowed lab and uh, then they said now this is a facility available from applied materials now we want to work with the with the faculty and students and on on the technologies which are of relevance to applied materials 
Now, once the lab was set up, then people came forward and started working. Now, if you look at the applied materials, R&D in India, it all happens out of IIT Bombay because that facility was created by them. Now, now they are undertaking projects for their corporate, which are all very high end, which are very futuristic. Now, there are like 40 people of applied materials, from applied materials, who are stationed at IIT Bombay. Now, they have a 5,000 square foot kind of an area. It started as a you know, thousand. Uh, a square foot sort of a lab now it's 5000 square foot now there are more people more things happening they are filing patents they are working with students they are working with faculty that's ecosystem i think you know industry is taking that long term view of establishing these facilities and working with the with the people i think you know now now they see that as a as very well integrated with applied research and they, and they were other day telling me if they keep an equipment in their uh, santa clara facility even if they don't operate the equipment, they actually pay much more, you know, for just keeping it in a clean room. Whereas at IIT Bombay, you keep it in a clean, clean room, operate it, get so much out of it, still the money is much less than what they spend in the US. I think that is what they are seeing as a benefit for them. And now they are growing, you know, quite uh, well in, in that kind of a scenario. So that is the model. I think uh, once industry takes that long-term view of establishing facilities jointly with us, Lots of things will happen because in IITs, you have the best people, the best students. I think what we lack definitely because of you no know, funding at IIT Delhi, if you ask me, 50% deficit in budget today, this, this year. I mean, now I can't expect government to keep on putting money. I think that other 50% should have actually come from the industries. And because that is not happening, you know, things are looking bad. Things are not able to grow at the But at the why do you think the government on. shouldn't put, put in the rest of the money? Today, you know, the problem is government, uh, the scale up of IIT system, if you look at, the government somehow has decided that creation of more institutions is a way to scale up the IITs. And uh, as a result, you know, the much of the money is going towards establishing new IITs. So while government should allocate more money for, uh, for, uh, for IITs, but the money that we allocate, in fact, other day I was telling the government, you know, if you look at the China, which everybody, you know, is aware of, look at two universities. This is all data available on the web, Peking University and Tsinghua University. Look at the budget of Peking University and Tsinghua University, the two universities. It is equivalent to the entire budget of MHRD for higher education. MHRD supports 120 universities. What MHRD is spending on 120 institutions in India is equivalent to the money China spends on two universities in, in, in China. So obviously, you know, we are not competing with them and we are uh, what we are. And so government needs to spend more money, but I think industry has to come forward and, and, and uh, fulfill that role. I think expecting government to keep on doing all the things, I think, is not going to going to work. They have established these institutes. Even the new institutes are actually coming up very well. You know, over a period of time, they will also be great institutions. But, but I think, you know, that ecosystem is there now. Now, if industry participates, puts in money, gives them the right problems, engages with these institutions, I think great things can happen. Yeah, great things can happen in India. And if you also, I just want to make one last point. India has actually done very well wherever, like what uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan said, in the mission mode uh, kind of a way. Look at ISRO or look at atomic energy. Wherever the government said that you do whatever you want to, you finally have to fly a satellite and the country does it very well. Wherever the goals are not properly set, you know, as a country, for whatever reasons it is, we tend to go all over. And, and then when you look at the output, nothing much happens. So in the atomic energy, you know, once they said, you do whatever it is, but you need to finally set up these plants, you know, they all happen. I think, you know, that mission mode kind of a way of doing things, you, uh, what has worked for this country. And, you know, for, for IITs, initially they said, you produce gra undergrad student. IITs were set up as undergraduate institutions. We became the world's best undergraduate institutions today. And then they said at some point of time, start doing research. Then we started growing our research output. Now all IITs have more PG students than UG students. At IIT Delhi, 65% of our students are postgraduate students and only 35% are undergraduate students. Now they are saying you are doing research, but now you need to convert, do more translational research. Now we are trying to you know, become better at that and that's also happening. It will take some time. I think you know these are all at the end of the day, 50 years, 60 year old institutions and we have a 200 years of, you know, the, the colonial kind of a rule. I think coming out of those mount mindsets and building these institutions is taking time. But I think funding is our biggest challenge today. And um, There's a question here. 
you know, all of you panelists. Uh, you Can you identify? I'm sorry. I'm Naresh, Naresh Shah. I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I run the R&D Center for uh, HP in India. You know, you spoke about, so first of all, uh, in terms of quality of research uh, papers that you spoke about, or we are not talking this session about innovation out coming out of India, uh, but there is enough uh, data on that as well. Indians outside of India are doing quite well. So it's not about the ability of uh, the, you know, uh, Indian folks. In India, you spoke about whether it's lack of funding, whether it's lack of, uh, you know, ecosystem, but there's something missing. I don't know, you know, Professor, you spoke about whether culture of uh, mediocrity uh, is uh, there in India uh, among folks, whether it's risk taking. I think there is something more due to which, I mean, even Professor, you spoke about, the, you know, you're mentioning about lack of funding. But even with whatever funds we have and whatever funds we are putting in, do we have commensurate, uh, you know, quality of papers, commensurate quality of product companies, commensurate world-class companies? We don't. So there's something else that's missing about what is it that we can do to, you know, uh, bring about higher quality of uh, output from, uh, from uh, our countrymen in this country. Can I? Would you like? I'll make an attempt uh, with my limited, uh, you know, exposure to research in the last three years. Um, as I said, you know, first of all, um, our team sizes are extremely small. You know, typically it's one professor with one or two students. You know, that's the team size, and their goal is to produce a paper because they evaluate it based on paper. Um, quality of excellence, there is limited. I you know, completely agree that we need to uh, establish a quality of excellence across our institutes and and hold them to a much higher threshold. But team sizes also have to be bigger. Collaboration, we collaborate better with institutions abroad than institutions in India. And that's because, you know, there is an opportunity to um, go and do some work there. But Indian institutions, across Indian institutions, the collaboration is sort of limited at this point. Um, so, you know, plus uh, when the funding comes from the government and the direction keeps changing, so, you know, there is now uh, a drive to look at more applied research. Suddenly everybody shifts their focus. Uh, yes, fundamental research is actually um, facing a threat in India because of lack of funding. Uh, and I have specific examples, you know, Chennai Mathematical Institute is a good example of an institution which may die because there is no funding and there are very good mathematicians there. And the question asked is, what is mathematics used for? Right? So they are not getting any funding. So there are examples of uh, such things and we need to address these things very quickly uh, because, see, we never know when and where this will be useful and how it will be useful and you have to let the researchers decide what they want to work in and and let them let them work on it till you know they they f they find something or they don't find something when i talked about mission mode projects i only said as a country we need a few mission mode projects and i agree when we have mission mode projects we seem to do very well, so let's have few mission projects, and those are also open-ended. Now, can we find a cure for Alzheimer's? Aging is a big issue, right? Uh, our entire world is going to face a challenge of aging. So, can we find a cure for Alzheimer's? That's the kind of mission mode projects I'm talking about, actually. It's really not, you know, can we create a better computer tomorrow? Um, so, that's what I believe we need to do. Right. I think, you know, that quality are, part of it, I just... Uh, if there are no yeah. more questions, then mm -hmm. I would request Shahid then mm -hmm. Dr. Rao to interject. Any questions? There's one. I can't see. Hi. Um, I'm Sandhya from ADECO Group, and we are an HR solutions company. One of the most common problems that we face, and this is something in correlation with building a very healthy ecosystem, is that 
fairs, in-campus recruitment for jobs, for research, and for research-oriented um, jobs in pharma, et cetera, et cetera, in, in the top tier institutions. Um, we have a huge amount of students studying applied science, research, engineering, in mid-tier universities as well. And uh, it's become a common trend for people with very good degrees to move into something else because they're not finding the right jobs. How do we create this collaborative ecosystem where the top universities within India, with mid-tier universities in India, work together to create something healthy and pool resources rather than, as you mentioned, looking towards the West or moving to some... Is, do you think funding is the core issue? Because um, I think it, it may be something more. No, there's one more question. Well, directly uh, relates to the sense I'm a digital great political scientist uh, from Germany and South Asia expert. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of the issue that India yeah, for a long time it has been known for uh, producing more academic output than it can actually employ, uh, which is uh, an issue of a long time, 20, 30 years or so, and it's actually growing. Um, at the same time, there are other models, uh, let's say in the US or, or other countries, where uh, universities and institutes are using their resources to create facilities for employment of students in terms of self-employment, in terms of job creation, in terms of startup centers. Uh, to what extent does India uh, go for this opportunity which requires structural change, administrative change, where you have to change the mindset that actually you have to create the jobs yourself. I think that's one issue which we have not been able to touch upon during the discussion about the governance of, of our institutes. Is there a question there? Yeah, I can't I'm, see. I'm from, yeah, I'm from State Bank of India, uh, and I'm an economist. So my question is that uh, if you have to cultivate a mindset towards a scientific uh, pursuit, then is it not important in India that we should create a textbook for history of science and technology? I, I, I find it very odd that NCRT runs a history book, but it never runs a course on history of science and technology. Now, why I said it? Because I was supposed to draft a speech for SBI chairman, and it was on a scientific topic. Now, I had very deep pains to find out a book which talked about history of, history of Indian science and technology. There was no book. That not a single scientist, I, of course, I can read books by, uh, say, Dr. Abdul Kalam or, say, biography of, say, Vikram Sarabhai, and I can understand a few technologies. But there were so many technologies. And I think, so when it comes to scientific education, my own take is that not only the past is uncertain, even future is uncertain. So we, the time spectrum and the, and the outlook itself has become narrowed to very, I'm not saying the scientists are bad or the institutions are bad. But the fact is that the, the key to ignite the mind, which is like the textbook of history of science and technology itself is missing. That Thank is you. what is my take. Thank is. you. So yeah. what I will do is, since we are very briefly. Yeah, very briefly. So uh, introducing myself, uh, I am a salesman. I work in TCS. Uh, two questions. One uh, is uh, the question of the government spending on creating more IITs rather than spending at an IIT. So, so the question of scaling out versus scaling up, uh, I just wanted to get some uh, inputs from, yeah. the, from the members on what their thoughts are. I mean, what, 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 is, what uh, will create excellence? Is it scale out or is it scale up? That is the first question. The second is the funding of the government doesn't necessarily come from the Ministry of Science and Technology or whatever. See, if you look at uh, several of the cases, for example, uh, there was this case in, uh, in US where uh, potato skin was used to, to treat burns. That entire funding was done by the Army, US Army. Uh, the company checkpoint, if you're uh, aware of, uh, which is in the security business uh, globally, came out of Israeli Army, okay, funded entirely by Israeli Army. So the funding from the government, which is a very nebulous entity, is not just Ministry of Science and Technology, right? So it has to spread. And if it spreads, I think we will have what uh, Krish was uh, looking at, you know, uh, 
upping the spread from the from the government. Thank you. So since there's not much time to answer all the questions individually, <laughs> what I would do is request the panelists to say in a couple of sentences their parting thoughts and keep some of the issues which have been raised by people from the floor so that we could address them differently in each one of our statements and not go over and repeat them. Maybe we could start with Shahid. Your parting thoughts and keep some of the questions, issues yeah. which have been raised, which you feel you could answer. So there, there was an interesting question, you know, why Indians outside India do well and Indians in India don't do as well. Uh, yeah, I, I believe, you know, a general answer is ecosystem, but ecosystem involves many things. Uh, it involves colleagues, it involves students, postdocs, and postdocs is something which is almost entirely missing from our research ecosystem. Uh, core facilities, collaborations, size. Now, let me dwell on size for just half a minute. An institute in India is about the size of a department in a major you know, university in the US. An institute is a standalone entity. If you have to collaborate with somebody who does something very different, you have to go to a different institute or a different university. You cannot ever find the same, you know, a complementary person in the same institute. That doesn't happen in a US university. You go to a Stanford or you go to a Berkeley or you go to, you know, any medium-sized university in the US, you will almost always find somebody to collaborate with in campus. So that's a, that's a big difference. Hindsight is 2020, of course. But institutes, when they were set up in India as separate entities, I think it was, was a mistake. Institutes should have been embedded in universities. And that hasn't happened. And maybe if we are going to set up new institutes for this or that, they should always be embedded within a larger academic environment. Uh, that hasn't happened, but I hope it happens because it will open up many more opportunities, not just for improving our universities, but also giving institutes the kind of talent and ecosystem that is ideal for them. So, Chitra, your 60 seconds. <laughs> um, so, one of the things I'd like to emphasize is that, yes, why are Indians doing better outside than here? Um, one of the issues is that the best students don't pursue fundamental research here. The idea is go to do medicine or engineering, which will give you um, a career, which, which I understand the motivation for that. Uh, but I think um, increasing the desirability of pursuing a career in fundamental research, and this is also tied to the fact that what do you do after a degree uh, such as that? And um, elsewhere, one can do uh, jobs in industry. So there's a pathway to go from a career in fundamental research, not just to academia, but also to industry. And so I think in order to cultivate excellent students and a culture of excellence, a culture of innovation in learning right from early on, um, I think this has to involve getting the best students and the best teaching and the best research environment. Um, and this involves uh, both injection of funding, um, injection of excellent researchers and teachers, embedding in universities, I think, is critical and ties with uh, university, uh, with industry and employers so that there is a pathway for excellent students in this route uh, to have a career not just in academia but in uh, the rest of industry as well are, are crucial for uh, the research ecosystem. Thanks. Um, you know, we did talk about funding. We talked about entrepreneurship, startup ecosystem. We need more of those. IIT Madras Research Park is a good example of something that seems to be uh, working. On history of, uh, you know, science and technology, I, I agree, and that's the reason why, you know, again, uh, you know, I'm from the IT industry, so I created an app called Itihasa, some self-promotion here. Uh, about the history of IT industry, and it's you know it's it's actually if you want to build something, look at the IT industry. You know it's the you know second largest uh, ecosystem for IT professionals in the world. 
Almost every single company that you can think of is running their IT out of India today. And um, you know, we have four million professionals uh, uh, doing all kinds of work in India, in, including high-end work, research work, etc. And why did it happen? Because the seats were sown in 1955, um, interestingly by Homi Baba and people like that, Vikram Sarabhai. And I've actually documented the history of Indian IT. And, um, and I think it's necessary to look at some of those things. We had excellence in science and uh, uh, also, but somewhere we lost our path uh, and we need to go back. Uh, and to me, I think we, we have to also think about where we are in the development of the country, where we are as actually as a per capita income and things like that. And something to do with that is also uh, where you know what the reason for where we are actually you know per capita income is eighteen hundred dollars or two thousand um, dollars so you know if I were a father I would send my child to engineering or medicine because that's what is very important for me at this point of time yeah I think I, I just wanted to address the this quality thing you know everybody somehow thinks that the quality of research is bad because of whatever reason it is. Just go to QS. If you look at the QS ranking, which is one of the respectable, uh, very respected international ranking, there is an app you can download. And you can there you can actually look at how the, our institutions figure in terms of multiple parameters they, they, they rank the institutions with. Overall ranking, there is something. Look at the research output. All main IITs will figure in the top 50. Um, compared to the world universities. Now you can say the quality is bad. How does one judge the quality? Looking at the number of citations to your paper. And if you look at the citations, all main IITs again rank in the top 50. IIT Delhi is ranked 32 in terms of citation index. Now how do you judge quality? How many people are citing your paper? And that is where Indian institutions are actually doing very well. IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi actually figure in the top 50 when it comes to even the quality of research. So therefore, it's a myth that our research is bad kind of thing. With whatever money that we are getting, we are actually doing a decent job. What is missing right now in Indian system is the society connect. Now, because we are not connected to the society close enough, the, you know, we have the, all the autonomy to decide our problems and work on a solution. Nobody gives us a problem. Nobody asks you know, whether the solution will work or not. So we decide our problems, publish a paper, do very well, people cite, but nothing happens beyond that. I think that is where the society connect needs to become better for our academic institution. There are Indians in US working on American problems. There are Indians in India working on American problems. The other day I was sitting on a on a panel for uh, selection of somebody. The guy is modeling uh, environment in London. Why? Because now I want to publish a paper in a particular journal. If I model the environment in Delhi, I cannot publish a paper in that journal. Only if I model the London uh, climate, I can publish in that paper. Because the person is so focused in publishing a paper in that particular journal, and an Indian problem will not get him a paper in that journal. So therefore, that is what we have brought down eventually to. I think that society connect needs to get better. We need to start working on the real problems. Our goal in academic institutions needs to be, like I said, 10x better, 10 next cheaper then every problem will become world class problem and after that you know everything will actually work work well i think the mindsets need to change we are so focused on publishing in those journals right now that is completely you know destabilizing the, comp the the ecosystem right now in the country i think once industries come forward give the right problems once we look at the big picture i think you know many things will will actually get better so the, and just to answer the question iits are still very small i think we need more iits we also need to scale up our existing iits i think both the things need to be done and Government is starting more IITs, also pushing us to scale up our existing IITs. But you know, at the end of the day, somebody has to fund them, and uh, which is currently the the issue. And hopefully, you know, the GDP in terms of percentage, the funds are becoming available. Things will change. I think, and I am hopeful. I think the transformation has begun now. And another 10 years from now, we will see a lot of good things happening in these institutions. So. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Dr. Rao, and. On that optimistic note, I think we come to an end of this session. And thanks, everybody, for your kind attention and your participation. And thanks, Alice, for putting together such a wonderful panel. And I hope there will be more and more of science in the future sessions of WF India. On that note, I thank all of you. Thank you. <laughs>